If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello Magic Community on YouTube, I'm T1 Glistener Elf, here with a quick deck deck for you for mono green in fact asterisk question mark question mark so you'll notice it's uh not exactly mono green but we'll, i'll explain right now in the main board you don't need the white the only thing that the white actually does for you at all is it lets you pay for apostles blessing we're getting to in just a moment there are some sideboard shenanigans that we're doing however so let's get started I should note before I give you the OG that um, the reason that I came up with a deck like this is that if you're trying to work your way into Infect, Mono Green is where you should start. It's the cheapest variant, and so you can start building Mono Green Infect and work your way into other colors like Simic, for instance, or Golgari. I also think that there's a case to be made for Selesnia Infect. Selesnia is my favorite guild, to be sure because I'm a communist like that. Eh, kind of. Uh, but I believe in community, let's say. But also it's the case that it has, white that is, has a lot of great sideboard cards. And we're only going to get into a few of them right now, but even the ones that we do have are excellent, as you can see down here. Uh, let's get started. We have Glistener Elf as a four of, sort of speaks for itself. When you just need to take them out that quickly, Glistener Elf is where you want to be. Best against the uh, decks that are low interaction but very fast, like Ad Nauseum or Pyromancer Storm especially, where they're not going to be doing very much to take you out early, but they themselves have a fast game plan. You need to take them out quickly. The OG is how you do it. Uh, next we have Ickerclaw Mirror. Now this is our Blighted Agent, or Plague Stinger I suppose depending on your color combination. Uh, since we're mono green, uh, or if you're just running not green, or excuse me, not black, not blue, Icar Claw Mirror is where you want to be. Very simply, very powerful effect. Actually can trade with the creatures in Zoo, for instance. Uh, with Trample, it's plus two, plus two gets even crazier, because at that point they're damned if they do, damned if they don't. Next, I have a 1 of Viridian Corruptor, which is questionable. I am not sure if this should be... I'm getting messages all over the place. A Viridian Corruptor or, alternatively, Necropede. They have their ups and downs. They have their uh, pluses and minuses. Their pros, their cons. There we go. In the case of Viridian Corruptor, it's mainboard artifact hate which not only helps against the affinity match, but also gives us an out against Ensnaring Bridge, which comes in both in 8-rack and in Lantern Control, to be sure. And so having mainboard artifact hate is nice. It's also a 2-2, you may note. And cards like Gutshot, Dark Blast, Knight of Souls Betrayal won't take out Viridian Corrupt. Well, I guess Dark Blast could if they upkeep, cast it, and then dredge, and then cast it again. But for the most part, no, that's not what's happening. Uh, so Viridian Corruptor is nice for that. Necropede actually works for a number of decks. It works against Soul Sisters a little bit more so. Uh, it works it in the mirror, where you can two for one the opponent. But most importantly, it's cheaper. It's two mana versus three. And that means that whereas Viridian Corruptor is more likely to get stuck in your hand, we only run 21 lands in the deck, Necropede is less likely. So in and of itself, that might be why you run this uncommon as opposed to that one. But right now, I'm trying out Viridian Corruptor. I like the idea of having a little bit more uh, artifact hate. Bear in mind that it also destroys one of our two main enemies, and that is Spell Sky. We don't have Twisted Image, we can't run Twisted Image in this deck. And so Viridian Corruptor kind of functions as our Twisted Image, I suppose. Next we have a four of Ink Moth Nexus. Now, because we're running the mono green version, if you don't have four, don't worry. Buy one and then work your way up to four. And I'll show you why in just a second, but you definitely need at least one. This is your anti-control hitter. 
this can't be countered. It's a little bit harder to kill because it's only a creature on your turn usually, right? Sorcery speed removal doesn't work on it, like say Wraths for instance. So Ink Moth Text is pretty sweet. Downside it is an artifact, but you're usually okay with that. You can protect it as a creature. We have four noble hierarchs, both for the passive pump that can't be taken with spell skype and simply because a lot of decks just absolutely do not respect your noble hierarchs. They don't respect the life total. And so you can get them low enough by them just taking hits on their own that noble hierarch becomes a serious threat. It is a 1-2 ramp creature. It also makes the one land hands a little bit more capable. Absolutely. Next we have the most underrated card in mono green, in fact, in my estimation. This is Sylvan Scrying. This kind of does it all, right? It is a creature, because it can go and get you Ink Moth Nexus. It is a pump spell, because it can go and get you Pendlehaven, or another card we have coming up. Uh, and it also fixes your colors a little bit for some sideboard cards we have, by going and getting a white sor source for you. So this card is very nice. It's kind of card advantage, it, it one for ones with itself. It gets you out of the late game by helping you to find the cards that you need. I think that it's unbelievably underrated. Oh, and it's utility, by the way. We have a sideboard card that's coming up. This one. Uh, that you can go and get with it. Next we have Four Apostles Blessings. I think that we need especially since we're not running blue, we need protection for our creatures that much more so, and since we're not running blue, we can't run Distortion Strike, we can't run Slip Through Space. This is our unblockability against basically every deck in the format except for Eldrazi, which is a lot less of a threat nowadays. Also, since we have these white lands, we can actually pay for the white in the Phyrexian mana cost. Also, Noble Hierarch will do that too. So, if you need it just to be simply keep my creature from dying for one mana and two life, that's fine. Against every deck except the burn decks, that's usually alright. And even against the burn decks, we can outrace them. If saving our creature means that we win, that's fine. Uh, but even against the burn decks, because we have white in our deck, we can pay the two mana and get out of it. We need that though. We need. I think we need four Apostles Blessings. Shoutouts to Peter Geiger, I think his name was. Um, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing it. Uh, link in the description to his deck from way back. This was before even Cons of Tarkir. And he showed me the power of four Apostles Blessings in Mono Green, in fact. And that one was actually Mono Green, not Mono Green parentheses, right? <laughs> so, next we have our pump spells, our legit pump spells, all of these. More protection for our creatures, and this one actually serves as a real win condition, right? For Vines of Vastwood. It gives hexproof. <laughs> it's not real hexproof, so if you're, uh, if you want to try to throw this on your opponent's spell skite, I'm sorry, they can keep taking your spells, that's how that interaction works. But, you can also stop equips, like a cranial plating for instance, you can stop your opponent's infect creatures from going off, uh, you can stop, and I used to say Splinter Twin, but now it's Kiki Jiki for a turn. Uh, this is an awesome card, it's actually more skill intensive than you might think. And this breaks the, well, not breaks the mirror, because obviously they have it too. But if you have this in the mirror, that serves a very crucial role in winning you the match. Next we have simply the most efficient pump spell in the deck, Might of Old Crosa. Upsides on your turn when you're trying to go off, it's pretty much always plus four, plus four. You know, notwithstanding some neat little combat tricks your opponents might have. Downside on your opponent's turn when they're trying to bolt your creature. I'm sorry, it's plus two, plus two, so you'll need something else to go along with it. If you're trying to save them from the most common card in the format, Lightning Bolt. Mutagenic Growth also will not save you from Lightning Bolt. However, even if you're tapped out, you can hold up a counter, if you will, against Pyroclasm, against Colagon's Command, non-metalcraft galvanic blast which rarely happens this can actually do something for you to be sure and it just gives you a little bit more um, 
oomph, it gives you more power behind your swing when you're trying to go off. Your opponent may think that you have enough to almost kill them, but not quite to kill them. This also gives you the turn 2 kill off the T1 Glistener Elf, which I'm not generally a huge fan of, but sometimes you just have to go for it. In decks that don't have Gitaxian Probe, where you can't see, yes, the coast is clear, it's rare that I'll actually try to go for the turn 2 kill, because I know that I can just get blown out. But if I already know what my opponent is on, for instance, or if I just have to go off before they, say, combo off on their turn, I might just have to go for it. Now, Groundswell is also a 4 of, and this I was a little bit unsure if I needed to have 4, or, believe it or not, if I wanted to have some number of giant growth, simply because giant growth, while less powerful, is always a counter to lightning bolt, Groundswell is a counter to lightning bolt on your opponent's turn only if you have a fetch land, and you can go and fetch on their turn. However, it is plus four, plus four, and that's where you want to be. Right, it's, it's that important in the match. Uh, yes, and it allows you to potentially serve as your giant growth, serve as some protection versus lightning bolt. Now, we have one become immense. Only one, because we aren't filling up our graveyard terribly quickly, like, say, the Simic or the Golgari versions are at which point you get a 2, 3, maybe 4. I've not been convinced that 4 is the right number just yet. But I could be, I suppose. I run 3 in Simic because I have more fetch lands, I have Gitaxian Probe, I have Sleight of Hand, I have some neat little ways to fill up my graveyard more quickly than this does. And next we have two Rancors. Again, because we're not running any Distortion Strikes or Slip Through Space, we need something to give our creatures evasion, or I guess in this case, pseudo-evasion. And Trample does that for us. Uh, this is awesomely mana efficient, when you consider that it's plus 2, plus 0, and you only have to pay the mana once, and it's Trample as well, and it has recursion, sort of. This is actually very nice. Now, they can kill the creature in response, and yeah, you'll lose your Rancor. But you need Trample. You need something in this deck, simply because otherwise they can chump block all day every day against you, and there's not much you can do about it. Yes, you do have Ink Moth Nexus to fly over, but you don't have your Blighted Agent. You don't have Plague Stinger. Uh, and so you need something like that. This gives our creatures protection from Lightning Bolt. <laughs> That's what I like to think of Wild Defiance as being. The one match where it doesn't is affinity because of Galvanic Blast, and I guess if they bring in Sideboard Flame Slash, that could do it, but against Jund, against Burn, this just gives your creatures all that they need to never die in the match, notwithstanding, say, Terminate, for instance. Yeah, or I, I guess Olivia Voldaren is now a thing in Jund, that's perhaps the case. So yeah, Wild Defiance is <laughs> underrated. I only run it as a one of because like Blood Moon, it feels sort of redundant in multiples. One is usually all that you need, and it's fairly expensive for the match, actually. So that's what I'm running in the main board. There are 39 spells, which means that we have 21 lands, which may seem kind of high, admittedly, but I think that's important for a number of reasons. 21 lands makes it where you're pretty much, and I, I know I'm going to eat my words after this, but you shouldn't ever get land screwed in a deck like this. That is to say, you should never have too few lands. Because the deck is so mana efficient, that you can play off of one or two pretty well. Again, notwithstanding Brooding Corruptor or Wild Defiance, everything else in the deck works just perfectly fine off of one or two lands. Now, that being the case, you can get color screwed, and I'm not saying off of white, I'm saying off of green. And the reason for that, we'll get to in just a moment. Uh, we have two forests, only two basic forests in the list. I'm trying this out. That may be too few. Uh, and we have one Temple Garden. You only need one. Uh, why am I even going to show you Temple Garden? That's fine. You know what that is. Windswept Heath, you know what that is if you play Modern. Actually, I'll bring this one up anyway, just to show off. That is the Judge promo. I got them when they were way cheaper. And I think 
if I'm not mistaken, that Kanza Tarkir, ever since they came, uh, Kanza Tarkir came out and made these modern legal, they shot up in price. I got them when they weren't, so gorgeous, gorgeous art, great foil. The fact that it's wearing three sleeves right now does not do it justice at all. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous card. Alright. Next, we have a one of Dryad Arbor, the card that Matthias Hunt thinks should be banned in modern or in every format, not because it's too strong, but because of the art. <laughs> and I kind of don't blame him. Apparently, this gets mistaken for an actual forest all the time. And I can kind of see that. I'm a little biased because I've played with this card for so long, I don't see that. But for a lot of newer players, yeah, I suppose. If you want to use the Future Sight one, that's fine. I think that that one's not as pretty. Again, three sleeves don't do it justice. In any case, what we really care about <laughs> is that it is a forest, and so you can go and fetch it with our fetch lands. And it is also a creature. It is a 1-1. One -one. Now, because it's a creature, it is summoning sick. It doesn't have haste. So if this is your turn one land, I'm sorry, no Glistener Elf for you. Not yet. You'll get there. And it is boltable. It is a land that can be hit with Lightning Bolt. However, this serves a number of unique functions for us. It may not be worthy of being in the main board, but because of these reasons I'm about to give, I'm including it as a one of. Firstly, the obvious, it's a combat trick. Your opponent thinks that you have no creatures, you fetch, you get a Dryad Arbor, you have a surprise blocker. Yes, that is the case. And because you have a surprise blocker, you have a surprise a pump creature, I guess. You can throw a bunch of pump spells onto it and take out their creature. That's fine. It's also the case, on a related note, that if the opponent just does not respect their life total at all, that's perfectly fine. You can actually beat them with the Dryad Arbor, beat down their regular life total. Uh, it also gives you protection against the card Liliana of the Veil. Now, it is the case that because we have four Noble Hierarchs, often if they cast Liliana, we can just sacrifice our pump creature, but that won't always be true. You can do some land shenanigans. You can tap Ink Moth Nexus to make itself a creature and then sacrifice it instead of, say, a Glistener Elf or an uh, Icar Claw Mirror or a Viridian Corruptor. Or you could fetch in response and go and get a Dryad Arbor and sacrifice that. That is true. Now, on a slightly related note, uh, this also gives you something that you can do if you have a hand with a number of lands but no creatures and one of your lands is a fetch land. It's not great, but it makes the hand potentially keepable if you just absolutely need to. You can just fetch for Dryad Arbor and go off the Dryad Arbor beatdown plan. It happens. It is a thing. I've done it before. Uh, if you're playing against the Malira decks, that's what's going to happen anyway. Your creatures are going to turn into Dryad Arbor. Uh, and so that is... That is something... That is an alternate game plan that you have. Now for our next land, this is not supposed to be Sun Petal Grove. This is supposed to be Razor Verge Thicket. So I apologize for that. Uh, the reason is because Razor Verge Thicket is the, I guess, fast land? The Scars land? It's the one that comes in as both colors if it's one of your first three lands, which is where this deck is going to be the vast majority of the time anyway. If it's coming out later than your first three lands, it usually, usually doesn't matter that it's coming in tapped. Uh, Sun Petal Grove, on the other hand, doesn't give you the T1 Glistener Elf. So, sorry about that. It's supposed to be Razor Verge Thicket. Thankfully, that's what was on screen, so at least you got to see it. Next, we have just a one of Pendlehaven. Now, in modern, this could be a 2 of, and I run it as a 2 of in the Simic list. It is legendary, so you get diminishing returns for more than one, that is true. However, usually that's perfectly fine anyway, because it's such a powerful land, you want to have more than one. However, because we run Sylvan Scrying, we can go and get the 1 of more readily. So again, Sylvan Scrying lets you get not just creatures in the form of Ink Moth Nexus, but also pump spells in the case of Pendlehaven, or... This is why I say we might get color screwed in the deck somewhat readily. Obviously, Ink Moth Nexus will not give you colored mana, it's colorless. Same goes for Cathedral of War. Now, this enters the battlefield tapped, so it does put us behind a little bit, and it only makes colorless mana. So of the 21 lands in the deck, 8 of them don't produce green mana, which means only 13 do. That's a little bit risky for us, but 
another passive pump, exalted. Again, shoutouts to Peter Geiger. Please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name. I think it's G-I-E, G-E-I, excuse me, G-E-I-G-E-R. You know what? Link in the description to his list. Uh, but he showed me the power of this deck by top eighting at a BTQ with this. And Cathedral of War, one advantage it gives is it's a pump spell that can't be taken away by spell Skype. Another reason is the more passive pumps you can stack on your creature, the better it is because if you get enough that your creature gets out of lightning bolt range, for instance, this is the best case scenario, then it forces your opponent to play a lightning bolt on your terms. That is to say, it forces them to try to bolt the creature before uh, you get to pump. Whereas if you pump first, now you're at the mana disadvantage. Say, for example, Glisten Ralph swings and you want to go for lethal. You could play the pump spell, they could play the bolt, and then you need to have something else to protect the creature. At least one other thing. However, if your Glistener Elf gets big enough that it's outside of bolt range, or Pyroclasm, or not Pyroclasm, that's Sorcerer's Speed, Coligon's Command, then it forces the opponent to have to go first, and that gives you the advantage. But in any case, uh, Cathedral of War, the more of these exalted triggers that you can stack, and that gives us eight in the deck, and four Sylvan Scrying to go find them, the better it is for your creatures against Spell Sky and against Removal. Now, that all being the case, uh, that's what we have for the main board, 60 cards. Again, noting that some Petal Grow is Razor Verge Thicket, you see 21 lands, 39 spells. And for the sideboard, we have, the first one is just a one-of, because we can search it up with Sylvan Scrying, Bojuka Bog. This not only helps us against the Jun match, this can just win us Dredge. Just win the, the match for you right away. You see, none of the Reliquary decks, like Absin or Malira Combo, or Knight Combo, now that Retreat to Coral Helm is a thing, running these as a one-of, and I definitely don't disagree with them. Yeah, it comes in tapped, you, you don't care. This is basically a zero mana spell, that says, exile their grave, but you don't get to play a land this turn. That's basically what this is. That's all we care about. You know, this is just row, row, fight the dredge decks. Again, also helps you with Jund. Uh, it's not the only graveyard hate we have, but it's tutorable. We only need it as a one-off because we can get it so readily. Essentially, there are five copies in the deck. Uh, next, I am not a big fan of using Kitchen Finks to fight uh, burn in Simic, in fact. The reason's because I prefer Dispel. I... Okay, there's a number of reasons for that. I run Mainboard, Wild Defiance, and Spell Sky in my Infect list, and so I think I'm already good enough. Dispel is more versatile. We cannot run... I mean, I guess we could run Spell Sky, but even if we did, we can't run Dispel. And so Kitchen Finks is sort of the next best thing. If you're going on the I'm going to beat your life total down plan, that's not what you're running it for. This is, I will gain four life and kill two of your creatures. That's essentially what Kitchen Finks is. Comes in, gains you two life, and if they swing, then they lose a creature, you gain two more life, and then they have to use another creature or a burn spell, something as such, to take it out again. This is just so much raw advantage against the burn decks. <sighs> super good card, super good card but it doesn't quite fight on the same axis, which is why I'm not a big fan of it. But if you're not running blue, you definitely, I think, need to run a card like this. It's just so good! Kills all of their creatures and gains you four life over the course of the game. It's a little bit bad later on when you gain two life and then they can still bolt over your head, for instance. It's not great there. Also, it can kind of punish the opponent's Eidolon of Rhetoric, or uh, Eidolon of, not Rhetoric, that's the white one. Great Revel, that's it, Great Revels. Uh, because if they just do not respect their life total at all, again, you have Dried Arbor, you have Noble Hierarch, but now you also have Kitchen Finks to sort of punish them, punish them for just not caring, not giving shit. All right, so next we have Four Nature's Claims, Affinity. It works against a number of other decks as well, to be sure, but this is primarily for Affinity. I don't really see a downside to this card, right? 
it's one mana, gives them four life, but usually you don't care. And actually, the giving your giving them four life can help you against burn if you just absolutely have to. So you could take out an Ichor Claw Mirror or an Ink Moth Nexus or a Wild Defiance, something in order to save your life total because you gain four life. That's possible. It also has some applicability against a few other decks. Uh, Enchantment Prison. You can use it against uh, Ad Nauseum, for instance. I guess, <laughs> right? You can take out their Mana Rocks. You can take out, or not Mana Rocks, the, the two mana one that has Sunburst. You can take out uh, Phyrexian Unlife, I think it's called. You, I don't know. It has, it has some general applicability beyond just the affinity match, but we care about that one a lot, not only because they can out, they can actually race with us. They're about as fast as we are, maybe about half a turn to a turn slower, but they also get to play mainboard removal like Galvanic Blast, and sometimes even Shrapnel Blast. I've seen that before too, if they're heavy on red in the mainboard. They can play Thoughtseize, they can play Spell Pierce, they can play a number of, they can play Fog, they can play a lot of cards that can make our day a little bit harder. And so we want to sort of overstock against them. Next, you see a lot of Infect decks run Dismember, and a lot of the reason for that is because of the mirror. It also helps to get us out against Malira and Spell Sky, because we need some help against those cards. Path to Exile is a way to get out of those without being quite as feel bad, right? I, I like playing Dismember when there's black, so Golgari or Mono Black. I don't like it otherwise, because although it helps against the mirror, it doesn't help as much against, say, Malira, for instance. They're a deck that can... And it doesn't help against a lot of other decks that kill us on our life total, where Dismember always says you lose four life. Path to Exile is also cheap. It's only one mana, but it exiles the creature, so screw you, Voice of Resurgence. And it doesn't... See, it doesn't... It's not snuff out. It doesn't require us to pay four life, right? So, I very much like that aspect of it. Um, Pything Needle goes in against a number of decks. I also bring it in against Affinity. You can name Arcbound Ravager, you can name Cranial Plating, you can even name Spellskite with this. And there are a lot of decks where this just incidentally hates on them. So, first thing that comes to mind is Ad Nauseum. If they go off with Angel's Grace Ad Nauseum, it's not great, but Lightning Storm, you can name that, because that's an activated ability. Uh, same thing off of their uh, Lotus Blooms, I think it's called. Same thing off of their Sunburst Artifact. Uh, you can name this for uh, Knight of the Reliquary in those decks. You can name Visser Seer for the Malira combo decks. You can name Spike Feeder. You can just incidentally hate on a lot of different decks. In Jund, Olivia Voldaren is actually one of our bigger weaknesses. Uh, because she can just rapid fire one damage to our creatures. One damage kills everything except Viridian Corruptor. Uh, so you can name it against. Uh, you can name Olivia against Jund. Wild Defiance, by the way, does not save your Olivia. Or does not save you against Olivia. Fun fact. Next, rest in peace. Again, Dredge is a thing. But so is Tarmogoyf. So are Jund decks in general. Absin as well. Uh, you know, this just incidentally hates on a lot of decks. Because we're running white, we can just run this you can't win card that works for so many decks. Pyromancer Storm, although they can win without Past and Flames, as we know, it's much harder for them. It's just great general hate. And because we only run one Become Immense, this really doesn't hurt us much. It hits Become Immense and Rancor, kind of, and that's really it. <laughs> we just do not care. And lastly, because you can never have enough hate, I suppose, against Affinity, Stony Silence, although this is also for Tron, this gives us something to do against the Tron decks, and again, a few other decks that it incidentally hates on as well. We're running white, we might as well run Stony Silence because it's so good against them. And if it looks like we're overstocked against Affinity, it's a strong portion of the meta right now, and it's a deck that can prey on us uh, more than a lot of the other fast decks. So, your biggest weaknesses when you're playing Infect. You've got Jund, you've got Burn, Absin, especially the Malira ones, and you have Affinity, which is kind of favored against us, not too... I'd say Affinity depends on the list, but I'd say that it's about 55-45 in their favor, 
because they can outbrace us with removal as well. You could say the same thing about burned, they're also favored. Maybe it's 55-45 or 60-40 for them. What makes that a doable match for us is because we run so much protection for our creatures. Yes, we have Apostle's Blessing, which also lets us bypass their creatures. We can swing through them. Vines of Vast Wood. All of our pump spells, although some of them have the caveat that they don't work against Lightning Bolt on the opponent's turn. Might have Ulcrosa and Mutagenic Growth, but Groundswell is fine. Become Immense is fine. Wild Defiance will get us there. If you're worried about those matches, if you're worried about burn, yeah, Giant Growth is where you want to be. Same thing with Jund. Maybe replace some number of them. Mutagenic Growth I'm a little questionable about. In some metas, it's just not enough. Two damage is not fine. But as long as Jund is as prominent as it is, Coligon's Command really does just do two damage. Mutagenic Growth is fine for that. Um, same thing with Tron. I'm, I don't respect Tron that much in this meta, but... They're on the rise because Jund is on the rise, and even without Eye of Ugin, they can still prey on Jund. So I respect Pyroclasm, the card. Mutagenic Growth helps you there. But if you don't see that as enough of the meta, change out some number of Mutagenic Growths for, I'm not kidding, I'm serious, Giant Growth. It, it may sound bad, but we're going back to Alpha. <laughs> we're going back to, you fight Lightning Bolt with Giant Growth. I really do think that that's part of the meta right now. And if Jund is that much of a thing, maybe you take these out anyway, because yes, it does hit Coligon's Command, but they run four bolts. And Burn is also a thing. Um, yeah, so Malira decks really do give you some trouble. It is true. Now, you can play through Spellskite, you can play through Malira. You have to play on your passive pumps in order to do that. Pendlehaven, Cathedral of War, Noble Hierarch, Exalted, and they can't use Pendlehaven to take or they can't use Spell Sky to take Pendlehaven because it's creature you control. Um, actually, no, that's wrong. It's just 1-1 one, one creature, but they don't have, like, any... <laughs> I'm sorry, I use a heuristic. They don't have any 1-1s one that you really care about that are named Spell Sky. That's a 0-4. So, it <laughs> doesn't really matter. Uh, yeah, you can also play through the life total with Dried Arbor and Noble Hierarch, but let's be honest, the Abs and decks that are playing Chords, they're playing Eldritch Evolution, they can really give you some trouble by going and getting a one of Malira or one of Spellskite. Uh, yeah, Collected Company is a card, and it does go and get the combo pieces, and one of those is Malira. So even without the combo, they can do it to you. That being the case, uh, you can. I've done this before. I wonder if I've done it on camera, I'm not sure. Um, if you want to put Spellskite in the list, Wild Defiant Spellskite is kind of interesting for getting you through that, for fighting through Abzan. Uh, blocks all their creatures, gets huge with Wild Defiance potentially. And yeah, I'm just, <laughs> at this point I'm just talking about the meta, giving you some outs. I hope that you have enjoyed this deck tech. Mono green, but with also plenty of white in here for some great, I think, sideboard cards. Some others you could consider include Eidolon of Rhetoric slash Rule of Law, uh, for fighting combo decks like Pyromancer Storm. Uh, it also gives you, white that is, gives you, uh, let's see, I don't think Ruined Halo is fine because it's white-white in the cost. And note that you only have essentially 13 white sources in the deck. Four Noble Hierarch, one Temple Garden, four Windswept Teeth to go get Temple Garden, and four Razor Verge Thicket, and that's it. That's really it. I don't think that's enough for white-white cost, and so something like Nevermore wouldn't really be a thing. But, you know, it gives you these only costing white or only costing one in white. Uh, some other alternatives, you can try Graft Digger's Cage in here. That would be pretty sick, both against the Dredge decks and against the decks that are going for, uh, say, Eldritch Evolution, Collected Company, Court of Calling. So it actually fights the Malira decks for you a little bit. So if you want to go for Graft Digger's Cage, perfectly fine. Make them have it. Make them just draw into it. Don't give them the cheat. Don't give them the out like that. Yeah, um, it also d serves against Elves, for instance, which is a deck that can prey on us, but isn't much of the meta right now. Uh, they're low to the ground enough that they can kind of outrace us, although they are slower. But also, we need Rancor Apostle's Blessing to swing through them, or the Ink Moth Nexus, which is kind of slow. Uh, and so they have a bit of a match against us, even though they don't have a lot of 
main board removal. Give them 50-50 maybe, depending on the exact contents of the list. And that's it for now. I hope that you've enjoyed the deck tech, and I will see you later. Take care, Magic Community. Bye-bye.